Welcome to Classes in Session presented by UI Health. I'm Doug Glanville. Martin Luther King Jr.'s words still echo in our lives. He dreamed, he marched, he appealed to our conscience to inspire us to find every way to include all people in the great experiment we call America. As he argued that a more perfect union required justice to be served, sports paralleled his efforts through a generation of athletes that sought change. Fists were raised, laws were codified, and the early steps of his dream took shape through a whole host of people who built the platform they needed with their own hands. In 2023, we continue the process of honing America to embrace all its people with equity and fairness. Many athletes that express the change they desire channel King and his mission. In many ways, he had the pulse of today because he understood how long the journey would take for equality to come to fruition. What do today's sports show us about how close we are to achieving Dr. King's dream? We will explore this question and more through two stalwarts in the world of sports. Howard Bryant, author, content guru at Meadowlark, and longtime columnist at ESPN, and Dr. Daniel Hosang, professor of American studies and ethnic studies at Yale University with a keen expertise on sports and its impact on society. Let's get to class. In 1960, Jackie Robinson wrote a letter to Martin Luther King Jr. In it, he expressed concern that members of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, of which King was its spiritual leader and president, were criticizing the historic NAACP. Robinson was worried about division and the lack of appreciation for an organization which was consequential in the expansion of rights for black people, and for which he was deeply involved. King would respond with a manifesto on the importance of unity and the value of having many perspectives that shaped the civil rights movement, from the legal slow game or legislative change to the catalytic nature of spiritual imperatives and marches for justice. King would express that this unity is more important than his standing. King said, quote, I have said both publicly and privately that before I become a symbol of division in the Negro community, I would retire from the civil rights struggle because I think the cause is too great and too important for few individuals to halt things by engaging in minor ego battles. Today, 55 years after his assassination, we look ahead to another year of sports and his influence on our culture. It is important to note that when Robinson broke in with the Brooklyn Dodgers, King was in college. Robinson would be a beacon of justice and equality that inspired King to endure the constant trials and tribulation of his efforts. Efforts meant to enact the greater good for larger society. Sport and society were intertwined. As we look ahead to 2023, we see many of the same challenges that King faced in 1960. The actors may be different. The identity of those who are marginalized are more diverse than ever. Yet sports still have a powerful voice in today's realm of social change, change that is predicated on the unity of those seeking it in body and in message. In addition, a vision to see the struggle as one that reflects the shared humanity. This sentiment appears when Megan Rapino kneels for black life, or Hudson Taylor from Athlete Ally stands with his LGBTQ friends and colleagues, or by extension, when a black woman, Keisha Thomas, protected a Klan member during an anti-Klan rally in which she was participating. As we look ahead to the moments where sports and its athletes can expand, repurpose, and underscore King Jr.'s activism from decades prior, we learn how far we have come, what pitfalls remain, and what we do with the inevitable nature of time that often sets us back by the inertia and at the behest of the status quo. What will 2023 bring? And what will be the true impact of King's fingerprints on the change that is coming? We're very fortunate to have our next esteemed guest. We have Dr. Daniel Hosang from Yale University who specializes in ethnic studies. And also my colleague at ESPN, Howard Bryan, who's done great work as an author and writer, ESPN, ESPN.com. So gentlemen, thanks for joining. Great to be here, Doug, and great to be with you, Howard. Nice to meet you all. You know, we're here in January and dissecting the impact and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. through the lens of sport. Uh, in my family, he shares a birthday with my, my late father, uh, so January 15th was special in our household. And, uh, and so one thing I'm you know, considering is 
When you look back at I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington, we know the March on Washington was for, for also jobs and freedom, uh, underlying the word jobs. So when we look at sports through that lens about the objectives of King and opening up opportunity with jobs and also influence at the top echelon of sports, I'm curious what you think the barriers are today, 2023, uh, uh, given his, his goals and where sports are when it comes to leadership at the top. And I'll start with you, Howard. I mean, especially, you know, being January and I always, you know, we go through this, Doug, you know, with in the NFL because the season ends and then you have all the coaches and then we go through the same Rooney rule conversations every year about hiring in the sport. And I think that this year it's actually even more pronounced when you think about what happened on field with DeMar Hamlin in that. Uh, one of the things that really did strike me when his heart stopped on the field was the division of labor, that you're looking at the number of uh, the players in a 70 percent black league. And, you know, here's a here's a young man who's receiving CPR on the field. And one of the things that was going through my mind was the you know, he doesn't have a pipeline to be part of this industry without putting his body at risk. Um that that's his piece of this industry. And uh, Daniel, you know, what do you see? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, first, I think, Doug, it's it's always good to be able to revisit Dr. King's insights and legacy, especially at a moment when so much of it, you know, is increasingly sanitized um, and just reduced into the one soundbite from the March on Washington, the um, wanting my children to be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And it we often ignore the much larger body of work and analysis. And I think centering this sports and a discussion about labor is really, really important. So I imagine, you know, we know Dr. King was assassinated in 1968 at a strike, striking sanitation workers in Memphis. And so he might ask us to think about all the labor, right? Well, and help me understand the pipeline question, because you mentioned uh, Damar Hamlin and, and his chance of kind of being beyond this sort of risk body risk uh, agent of of, uh, of work to the pipeline and how he would get to leadership position every sport has its own division of labor every sport has its own sort of coaching pipeline if you're a baseball player then you know some jobs become managerial track like catcher um and then other jobs don't become managerial track if you're a football player most of the head coaches um either didn't play the game or played a very specific position. So the, the guys who, you know, when you look at the sport, the, the, the way that it had always been described anecdotally had been, the closer you are to the ball, the smarter, you know, the more brains that there are in the position. Yeah, I, you know, and I think it's right, right? So there's what, five uh, vacancies, head coaching vacancies in the NFL now, you know, a number of offense coordinator, defense coordinator positions. Our attention goes there to the, it's kind of the last stage of this process, right? And the Rooney rule and what can be done. I think it's important to bear in mind also, this starts many, many years before this form of sorting, tracking, and hierarchy. So that even when you have young athletes trying out for youth football, Pop Warner, more competitive, they're also steered early into certain kinds of positions, right? Um, based on longstanding assumptions about intellectual ability, leadership, kind of raw athletic talent, et cetera. Yeah, Dan, that is such a great point because one of the things that happens when you're looking at who becomes coaching material, we always talk about the player to coaching pipeline, but we don't talk about the non-player to coaching pipeline. And the players who, you know, who age either age out or they get eight, they get they get wiped out of the of the playing pipeline because they simply weren't good enough or they just couldn't make that grade. Um, a lot of them find their way into a coaching pipeline very early on. And when you look at it from a, a, a racial standpoint, you know, you you have numerous stories of the white player who was the AV guy. You have so many examples um, in the NFL of players who weren't going to be professional players and yet found their way onto the coaching and the managerial side. 
you don't really have that when it comes to the black players. Black players are there to work. They're there to play. And if they're not playing, a lot of those avenues are cut off from them. Most of your great coaches in in virtually all of the sports, for the in most of your great black coaches are ex-players. So for them, they have two barriers that they have to overcome. One, you've got to have the world-class talent to make the league in the first place. You got to be one of the best 700 baseball players in the world to even have a shot to be considered. And then secondly, you have to be, you know, you have to have the opportunity to even begin the coaching. We continue our panel with Howard Bryant and Dr. Daniel Hosang delving into whether true change can happen inside the league structures of sport. Next on Classes in Session with Doug Glanville, presented by UI Health. Welcome back to Classes in Session with Doug Glanville presented by UI Health and our discussion with Howard Bryant and Dr. Daniel Hosang. So I, I want to talk a little bit about change, you know, because we talk about these systems and the systemic natures of stratification and limitations. You know, you go back to the, the March on Washington and there were critics about the content chosen about what to express uh, at that, in many of the speeches of, of the guests, inc- including Dr. King, uh, at one point with Bill Russell and others who framed it as a, a, a mere picnic. Uh, so I'm curious uh, your thoughts about evidence that change can happen within the system. Yeah, it's a great you know question for us to wrestle with now. I mean, one is a reminder that, of course, all of those iconic moments, the March on Washington, the signing of civil rights legislation, you know, fair housing legislation in the late 1960s were always themselves compromises. And there was always a broad set of visions and interests and understandings of what justice meant, what rights meant, et cetera. Et cetera. You know, at the same time, the, the incorporation in many ways seems quite symbolic. Right, a Latin night at a minor league park here, you know, a, a rainbow f- symbolic flag, you know, w- which are referencing really important struggles, but they haven't, in the same way, uh, um, translated into real material gains. And uh, Dr. King has a really well-known uh, formulation um, where he talks about the connection between love and power, and he says, uh, "Love without power is anemic and sentimental, and power without love is reckless and abusive." And I sometimes think we're now in the kind of love part where we're, we're dealing with symbols of these forms of incorporation and progress and, and less on the question of power on the, on the material points of it as well. It always does come back to this, the very same question. What do we need to do to get things done? And is what we have better than having nothing? Uh, what, what are we trying to accomplish? And and you, you're not going to be able in, in political situations to be absolute. Everything has to give. Something has to, um, you know, you you also recognize, and I think that Dr. King recognized, and I think if you re- go back to the political environment of 1963 at that time, you recognized that, that this was going to be, I mean, the, the battle at that time. So you always had to temper your sort of, expectations when you had those meetings, because once again, um, the black problem was not necessarily the main problem when you're dealing it from it, dealing with it from a presidential standpoint, right? They're trying to keep coalitions together. They're trying to get other legislation done on the whole thing. And so the more you push on, on this issue, the less likely you are going to have the sort of allies that you need to, to, to get anything pushed forward. I think there's something very similar today in which athletes are given a lane in which they're not saying you can't say anything, but this is what you, this is where you can stay without harming your own future, your own well-being. Go into this other part and you'll see what will happen to you. And obviously, the, the biggest story in the last 10 years is you know, Colin Kaepernick around that, but it really has disciplined athletes into being able to say some things that comport with the brand and uh, disavowing others. Well, exactly. We were talking about this very thing when you're talking about power, Doug. Um, you know, the you, know, you go back to 2020 and you go look at the George Floyd, Jacob Blake, Brianna Taylor summer. And after, you know, the players had the shutdown in August of, of 2020, the specific complaint was policing. 
specifically? And then how did that suddenly turn into registering people to vote? Like suddenly it became a very broad, very vague sort of movement when it was no, this conversation is specifically about policing and even more specifically policing in Wisconsin, policing in Milwaukee. And then we have the shutdown. And so you realize that the players are, you know, they go met with President Obama, et cetera. And suddenly it becomes a much looser, um, less focused more palatable, more acceptable um, uh, goal. Like the, the suddenly the objective is not anywhere near as sharp as it had been, which was the reason why they had shut down in the first place. Coming up, the power of symbolism and how it will affect the sports landscape in the year ahead. We'll be right back on Classes in Session with Doug Glanville, presented by UI Health. Welcome back to Classes in Session with Doug Glanville presented by UI Health as we continue with Howard Bryant and Dr. Daniel Hosang. Well, and then you think part of the solution to this is related to education, right? The idea of, all right, we need to learn more. We need to learn more about this history. But we're also at a time where there are states pushing back to restrict, whether you call it anti-woke, stop woke, Florida, and so on, to restrict a certain uh, openness about learning about this past, especially along the lines of race. So do you see any path, any avenue where sports or leagues get involved in this? I'm not terribly optimistic about whether those schools and whether the athletes that could really speak out against these kinds of issues are likely to say something. Um, in Florida, uh, AP African American History course was just rejected by the Department of Education there kind of in response to DeSantis. It's hard for us to imagine high profile athletes at the University of Florida, Florida State, other places aligning themselves with the students and teachers who really would want to struggle and fight for that content, not because they don't care, but because so much of the incentive system, you know, name, image and likeness and other is so skewed against them taking those kinds of stands, acting in solidarity in that way. Yeah, well, you think back now, you know, you mentioned King's assassination, you know, 1968. And, you know, whether his rhetoric shifted or he became more of a point of emphasis around the war, Vietnam War, and the risk that he started to take in sort of, you know, speaking a little more sharply about issues and more publicly. I'm, you know, I'm curious the lessons of risk versus reward in speaking out. Obviously, that's an, kind of an extreme case. And whether today, 1968, now 2023, that you believe his dream or the trajectory of his dream is still alive, it's still with us in the world of sports? Well, I, I sort of think that the importance of that level of dissidence that King had toward Vietnam was extremely valuable and very much underrated because he and Jackie Robinson actually broke over that very issue. Um, they, you know, Jackie was very much pro, pro-war and King early on, I believe in as early as 64, 65, was like, this is not, this is not the way. And it wasn't until much later, until 67, 68, 69, where Jackie, you know, because his son was over there, where he began to realize that, yeah, we were not in the right space. And the, the King influence on Jackie was just incredibly important and helped shape him even if it took him a few years to get there, that type of conversation uh, is is really, really valuable. And and I think that you don't necessarily get that nearly as much, um, not to make the exact same analogy, but you didn't have the sort of, you know, going to the, you know, the, the respected intellectuals uh, when the when the LeBron Jameses and the you know Giannis Antetokounmpo's and the rest of them went to Obama after Jacob Blake, they were not told to retain their dissidence. They were not told to to challenge. They were told to work within, which is a very very different message from the King Robinson exchanges, which was no, this is a moral question that you need to confront. 
I'll just apply. I mean, I think it's Howard mentioning this kind of militarism point. You know, when King comes out against the Vietnam War in 1967, he talks about the triple threats of racism, materialism, and militarism. So, you know, I, I think of it when I'm in stadiums and I see the kind of like the flyovers and the large flags. You know, that's that's something that's actually relatively new in the history of sports and absolutely cuts against so much of what uh, Dr. King, I mean, you, you know, was foundational to his vision of peace in the world. Well, gentlemen, this has been so enlightening to to talk to you both. And, um, you know, I, I focus a lot on the letter between Robinson and King in 1960, where King kind of lays out, you know, his vision, his constructs around social justice and change. And, uh, and you've seen that King was often hand in hand with sports. And to this day in 2023, his words still echo. And I'm, I'm glad to hear your words to help us understand and dissect how they do through sports in 2023, uh, 55 years later after he was assassinated and we lost his voice, uh, but his voice continues. So uh, I wanna thank you for your time and, and continued great work and uh, look forward to talking more in the future. Great, thanks so much, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Although King's musical voice was silenced by gunfire in 1968, the sounds and content of his impact endures. 2023 has created new context as the challenges of achieving equality remain and sports continue to offer an opportunity to engage. Sports also offer an example of the work required to level any playing field. Even this effort will be met with resistance that comes with the need for entrenched power to be a constant. Power hiring only within its private club of candidates, the risk assessment players and leagues constantly make about speaking out, and the way class and identity are woven into the fabric of opportunity. The King Jr. dream appears to still have a heartbeat that inspires us, yet today the speed of information and the speed of reaction can cloud the long game required to make any change long-lasting. Still, conversations continue to be ignited in the spirit of his messages that always contain both optimism and caution. There is plenty of work to do for his words to become a normalized way of life, an expectation, but the steps are still being taken to bend the arc towards justice despite any forces that push against it. I'm Doug Glanville. See you in class.